So I'll recognize myself for five minutes for questioning. And uh, the National Academy's Pathways report from 2014 included a sand chart uh, that depicted the notional budget for exploration. So I would ask that uh, you wouldn't mind, uh, please pull up that chart. Uh, thank you very much. The chart broke down funding for the ISS, uh, for the SLS, Orion, as well as exploration technology and research. And the chart visualizes how, without significant increases to the exploration budget, the development of any new projects coming uh, going forth would be delayed in order to accommodate the continued operation of the ISS uh, on to 2028. Last March, this subcommittee held a hearing on the plans for the ISS after 2024, and at the hearing, we heard testimony about how slight increases to the exploration budget have allowed for some uh, bit of flexibility uh, to these projections. So I'd ask you to pull up the second chart, if you would. I'll turn this thing on. There we go. NASA's exploration budget request for FY19 is $10.5 billion, and while this is considerably more than was envisioned in the Pathways report, that $10.5 billion now includes approximately $1 billion in activities previously funded under the Space Technology Mission Directorate. And so let's assume that budget caps are not lifted significantly in the future. Uh, if the ISS is extended past the current authorized date of 2024, what new projects will be delayed? And would the lunar orbital platform or the gateway uh, be delayed? Would it prevent the start of a human lunar excursion vehicle development until after the 2030s? Well, I think if you look at the budget request we have and where we're proposing to eliminate government funding for the ISS in 2025. Right. Um, that's our intent is to get, so we don't have to fund that um, in the future. And so the, the total program though, when you when you look at it, what we want to do is work the, the, the Mars vicinity. We want to get the platform built. We want to build these robotic landers to and from the moon. They're, while, while it's not a perfect um, transition from what we're doing in low Earth orbit. There's not like a switch we're going to flip and magically go right. there, right? What we want to use now this year, this budget year, is to go determine what are the commercial capabilities that would allow us to fill the gap that you show in your chart after 2024. What would they, what, what capabilities are going to be there? So you're going to see a series of announcements from us. We're trying to stimulate that with 150 million in this 20, uh, 2019 budget and roughly if, you know, in the out years that would be 900 million over time to see who can fill that slot so so we can move on and build those gateway pieces. Okay. Um, that's, that's the way we're looking at it. Okay, thank you. And then second, if NASA transitions low Earth orbit operations to the private sector, how will NASA preserve the unique expertise and capabilities uh, related to mission operations, program management, systems integration, including habitat, and astronaut training, among other core competencies uh, that reside at, the, at Johnson Space Center? Is there a long-term strategic plan that clearly delineates core center roles? And for the past several years, every time we've asked headquarters, the answer has been we need to wait and see. So what 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 say you about that? Yeah, we, we've spent quite a bit of time in the last two or three years defining um, center roles and, and what the roles are. And of course, JSC, Johnson Space Center, has those roles that you described. Um, we believe those, those roles continue as we move into the right. lunar platform. And we also, one of the other things we want to learn from the request for, for the commercial folks this, this upcoming year is what capabilities they want to depend on. Because mission yeah. operations, astronaut training, those are things we can offer um, and get reimbursed for as we right. move forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, a backup plan for commercial crew. When the commercial crew partners experienced delays two years ago, NASA was able uh, to maintain U.S. access to the station through the purchase of additional Soyuz seats through Boeing as a result of their sea launch settlement. Additional delays announced at their hearing earlier this year once again threatened U.S. access to the ISS. There are no more Soyuz seats to buy. Is NASA considering accepting addi additional risk by flying U.S. astronauts on commercial crew test flights? And if additional delays occur this spring, which is not out of the question, given the complexity of work over the next several weeks, is this risky option off the table? And are we in a position that we may need to scale back crew on the ISS? Well, we have to 
front load our agreement with the Russians to maintain a steady crew in the near term, which will end up costing us more in the out years to accommodate their cosmos on commercial providers. I know I'm trying to get these, these questions in before I run out, so if you can but, answer some of those, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, so um, in, in the spirit of time here, what I, we are looking at several options along that line. Right. Um, I can tell you that we're, we're working with the Russians, we're working with our commercial partners, but I, we maintain, com we're, we're still confident our commercial providers are gonna provide us the capability we need, and we're just looking at what contingencies in case that happens. What I would offer is our teams can come up and brief you on the different options we're looking right. at um, at some point. Brief okay. our staff on that. Okay, great. That's good. And I'm out of time, so I'd like to recognize Mr. Barrow now.